section four, oxygen sensors and fuel trim. Uh, we did talk about some fuel trim in section one. This is going to be a little bit of a review for some of that. And then there's some other aspects that I want to teach you guys using fuel trim. So starting on page two, our main focus is the narrow range O2 or narrow band. I'm not talking about the wide band sensor in here. There's a, a lot of different design wide band O2s and they operate completely different from this. So we're sticking with the narrow range O2 for, for all of this discussion. So there's, again, narrow range O2 is our focus. Narrow range zirconia O2 is what we're dealing with in this chart right here. And the reason it's called a narrow range sensor, and this is just a generic picture of that, that you're looking at a very small range, say full lean down here. So the lowest voltage you're going to see, or the highest voltage you're going to see, which is full rich, you're only talking about from 14 to 1 to 15 to 1 in that range, and that's why they call it a narrow range sensor. It's really a switch. Some of the early books actually called this an O2 switch because it only was able to indicate where stoichiometric was. And that's right where that O2 would switch, right near that 14, 7 to 1 ratio. That O2 is going to switch. Everything above here, everything above this set point is rich, and everything below it is lean. Now, the thing about this sensor is it doesn't tell the computer how lean. So once you get down to 15 to 1 right here, or if you went 15.5 or 16 or so, and so on, the O2 is simply going to be lean the entire time. It doesn't tell the computer how lean it is. It only says that it's lean. And it's the same thing on the rig side. If you went 13.5 and 13 and so on down the line, this O2 would be full rich the whole way. So it's called a narrow band or narrow range O2. The main difference with the wide band is the wide band O2 is actually able to report the exact ratio to the engine computer from roughly 12 to 20 to 1 it can report the actual air fuel ratio where a narrow band narrow range O2 cannot. So that's why the Another one that this can be done using the oxygen sensor would be on EGR flow monitoring. Um, the only reason that I chose this picture for this is I wanted to illustrate that on this kind of EGR system, in this picture, there is no flow monitoring capabilities at all. All this is is a solenoid that the computer controls. It's vacuum operated and back pressure operated for flow rate. There's nothing in there that would tell the computer there's an EGR flow problem. Yet, these vehicles will set EGR flow codes. And it's, everything else is the same. We still base our fuel correction and air fuel ratio based on other inputs. We're still basing it off of other inputs. What other input? What's the barometric pressure? What's the engine temperature? What's the intake air temperature? What's your throttle angle? What's your mass airflow reporting? What RPM are we at? So those are all factor in both modes. The only difference is in closed loop, we're going to try to maintain this stoichiometric ratio for the cap to do its job. A little bit rich, a little bit lean. We're constantly, as we drive our cars, dropping in and out of closed loop. This was a vehicle that had a bad O2 sensor. This is an older GM. Older GMs use Block Learn and Integrator for short term and long term fuel trim. So, Block Learn says Block Learn Mul um, on the picture, it stands for multiplier. This is your long term fuel trim. And Integrator is your short term fuel trim. 128 is zero. We can uh, verify this, by the way, on, on my chart that I have on page seven. You guys don't need to go there, but that's what, that's what these numbers are. 128 is the equivalent of 0%. Numbers above 128 is adding fuel. Numbers below 128 is subtracting fuel. In our picture, in this case study, we're about 160, 160 on the, on the uh, block learn. So that's going to put us somewhere around, uh, I don't know, 25%, 30% roughly addition of fuel. Car. And in this case, we went from 
Closed loop to open loop, so a fault. What I'm trying to emphasize again is that we will drop into open loop another time that that happens is with a fault with the O2. So in section five, again, I have some case studies on our switch rate and frequency, show you a known good, a known bad, and, and we'll plug these numbers in, have a little bit better visual. Okay, the last part on page six is sensor side wire colors. And the reason I'm giving you sensor side colors is on some vehicles, you cannot see the harness side. Let me show you a picture of one. All right, so on this video, this Ford O2 circuit integrity test, just to give you a little perspective of what we're looking at here, this is the drive axle right here, and then this is the back of the engine, and this would be what I'll call harness side. Harness side of a connector is the side that never leaves the car. And then all I can see is my sensor side connector. Uh, I cannot physically see the harness side colors on this car. So positive numbers, there's no plus sign on the scan. Negative numbers, of course, there's a minus sign on scan data. So our rich codes, these are going to be negative fuel trim numbers. 172 is bank 1. 175 is bank 2. And so this kind of backs up these code numbers. This backs up our note right here that says with left and right bank, O2s, upstream O2s, we're going to have individual bank controlled fuel trim. A word of caution with these trouble codes, it is not uncommon to have, say, a vacuum leak set only a single bank trouble code, even though it's affecting the entire engine. Or it's not uncommon to, say, have low fuel pressure, which would, of course, be the entire engine being affected by it, all the injectors, both banks. It's not uncommon to only see one bank flag of code. The reason for that is you may have that moment of time where the computer runs that diagnostic on its system, where it's monitoring that, and it just happens to flag that trouble code when one of the banks is worse than the other, and it only shows up as a single bank lean condition. This one, what's going on here? This is an ASE L1 test question. Uh, I remember taking the test and, and uh, seeing a data capture like this. And the question said the mechanic recently replaced the intake gasket and did not clear the memory. And here is the after data capture. And they gave you multiple choice on what the problem is. Engines run rich, engines running lean, engines running normal. And the answer is engines running normal. And that each of these cells, say from the factory, you would want to have 0% correction all the way across the board. And let's draw one, let's say this one has a vacuum leak, and I want to show you what, what this may look like with a vacuum leak. Again, these are just, this is just a, a hypothetical here. You might have 30, 25, 25. And as you go up, you know, this starts to drop, 15, 15, and these start getting better. Maybe these are like 5, 5, you got 0, 0. So basically a vacuum leak is really going to be affecting these lower cells very, very much. Okay? And so as you can see that the upper portion, higher RPM cells are more rich commands with a dirty mass airflow sensor or low fuel pressure.